Hi and welcome back. Today we're going to take a brief look at strategy and tactics number 129, Harvest of Death, the second day of Gettysburg. This uh, was published in the August-September issue in 1989. The cover was painted by D. Gallion. It's his interpretation of the view from Little Round Top. Inside the issue you will find eight pages of rules. This is the first page, the second day at Gettysburg. It uh, gives all of the credits and then the table of contents. Uh, let's go ahead and read the credits real quick. Game design and development by Dr. David Martin and Leonard Millman. Further development is Christopher Perello. The map is by Michael Simonich. Counters, Larry Hoffman. Typeset and layout is Larry Hoffman and Beth Quayman. Playtesting is by the Mercer Adventure Gamers. Table of Contents, Introduction, Game Equipment, Sequence of Play, Movement, Facing, Zones of Control, Combat, Close Assault Combat, Victory Points, Scenarios, Optional Rules, such as Union Artillery and Command Control. Then we have the Order of Battle and the Counter Manifest. See if I can get a close-up here of the units. Here we have an example of a combat unit. This one happens to be a Union combat unit. Um, you can see from the information printed on it that it has a division leader at the top. Its own designation is along the side. The uh, brigade leader is across the bottom and the unit's combat strength is along the right hand side. In this case, um, the, the back side will show the unit at a reduced strength. In addition, Union leaders will also have another counter that will have a front and a back, showing the unit at even more reduced strength. Confederate units are broken up as demi brigades. They have the division leader at the top the actual brigade name at the bottom. They have their strength on the right hand side and on the left side the A and the B will indicate the brigade wing. Um, let's see, all Confederate units have just um, two sides. They have the front side as you see and the back side is a reduced strength unit. Uh, as part of the Demi Brigade A. So if the Demi Brigade A takes a loss, you'll flip it over to its backside. And the same with B. And after that, they're eliminated. So while the Confederate units are slightly stronger in some cases, they're more brittle than the Union player, since the Union player can take more losses. I'm not going to be able to give you a very good shot of the sequence of play. However, the game is played in sequential game turns. A player whose turn is in progress is called the phasing player. The confederate player always moves first, followed by the union player turn. All actions must take place in the exact sequence outline. First thing we have is confederate player turn. We have movement phase. Then we have the small arms fire. The close assault phase and then we have the Union player turn in which he performs the same phases in order and then we have the turn marker advance phase where you'll just move the marker on the uh, game turn track one to the right uh, until the end of the game at which time you will uh, determine the victor according to the victory conditions for the most part everything else is fairly standard among hex encounter games. Um, the units have a standard movement allowance. It is not printed on the counter. The movement allowance for infantry is 5 and the leaders are 10. There are no cavalry and there are no artillery units presented in the game or present in the game. There is an optional rule for a one-time only Union artillery fire um, however, 
that is the extent of any kind of artillery in the game. Apparently the Union player didn't have any batteries in place or enough batteries in place to make a difference at the particular time the action is the action happened. We have facing. I don't know how close we can get here to look at it, but facing um, the unit is pointed to the top of the hex side. There are three frontal facing and three rear facing hex sides. The top hex side is called the central or center front. This is important for fire combat. Uh, all the hexes in the frontal hexes, which are the three um, to the front of the counter there, uh, exert a zone of control in which units must stop. You can leave a zone of control, but you cannot enter another enemy zone of control directly, and it costs two movement points to leave the zone of control. Then we come to what we have as combat. We start with a small arms combat. And this is where the rules really start to break down for me. Um, this is where they really kind of start to get confusing because oh, you can only fire to two hex range, and that's 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 okay. Um, however, there are certain prohibitions and stuff on this fire, and the zones that you can fire into. And stuff like that so basically only friendly units not in an enemy zone of control may fire well the enemy zone of control are the three frontal hexes um, at the top of the unit and let's see the range of fires two hexes counting from the firing unit to the target and it says here that units may only fire through their central frontal hex side the hexes which may be reached by a unit's fire are shaded below. Well, if you can only fire through the frontal center frontal hex side, then you should only be able to fire through the first uh, the first hex out to two hexes, because right here we have the center frontal hex side, um, which is the top of the unit. Now the other two adjacent to that are frontal hex sides. However, it clearly states here in um, bold that it has to be the central frontal hex side. So where they're getting the other two hexes off to the left and right, I do not know, but I'm assuming that that is what they really mean is any of the frontal hex sides are hex sides that are legal to fire through according to this diagram. The rules, as a lot of magazine games, leave a little bit um, to, your, to player interpretation. Oops, sorry. Um, there's flanking bonus, kind of explains there when and where flanking bonus applies. The results of fire combat are basically a pin or a withdraw. Pin units may not move in the next uh, friendly fire phase, and at the next end of the next friendly fire movement phase, they're removed. What did I just say? They may not. What did I just say? The unit may not move in the next friendly movement phase, and their pin marker is removed at the end of the next friendly movement phase. Yeah, that's what I meant. And then the other result is withdrawal. They must retreat one hex and then become pinned. Uh, let's see, what else we have? We have close combat, which is basically your normal... Sorry about all the moving here. Basically, you're moving up into the enemy zone of control and mandatory fire. Uh, like I said, the um, front three hexes are the are the main or only zone of control. The rear are the rear hexes. Yeah, that makes sense. And if you're in an enemy zone of control, you must attack. Yada yada yada. Blah blah blah. However, yeah, I'm showing the table. Uh, tripod leg. Hmm. Well, that's just the price we pay here for. Amateur night. Right, let's see if I can swing this around here. Get what you pay for, I guess. Okay, what do we have here? Which units can attack? 
those units, which are in the enemy zone of control. Yeah, I guess uh, pinned units can attack because there's no prohibition on that. And there's no penalty for attacking them or for them attacking back. So just want to bring that up because I had a question on that. Uh, let's see here. But some problem I have here with the uh, close combat is all the phasing players' units. My lighting is horrible. Sorry here. Just a moment. There we go. All the phasing players' units, which end the movement phase with an enemy unit in its zone of control, must attack some enemy unit during the ensuing close assault phase. The phasing player will choose which attacking units will attack each defending unit, and as long as they're all adjacent friendly units participate in some sort of attack. Well, that's great. Then we come to, what do we come to next? Ah, I still have my tri tripod in the way there. One moment, please. All right. Let's uh, see if I can go down even farther and get more of the tripod leg in it. Ha, there you go. Okay, then we have multiple unit and multi-hex combat. Well, this is all well and good. Um, all units defending in a given hex must be attacked as a single strength. Defender may not withhold units. The attacker must attack all units in a stack together. Um, different units in a given hex may not be attacked separately. Okay, so we have if more than one attacking unit is in a given hex, these units must be used as an integral combat strength. They must not be used in separate attacks. Well, that's great. Then we'll come up here, if a phasing player's units, unit is in the zone of control, oh, much nicer, of more than one enemy unit, it must attack all those adjacent units which are not engaged, okay. Then we have, <clears throat> and I'll try to clarify this, units of the same division in two or more different hexes may combine their strength and attack a single hex if all the attacking units are adjacent to the enemy occupied hex and now leaders are an optional rule. Um, they're one of the two optional rules. They're part of command control and the other one was the uh, Union Artillery. And by the way I do want to say that Confederate units can stack two units to a hex that is their demi brigades A and B. Union units may only stack one to a hex. So anyway, moving onwards. So if uh, the division leader is stacked with one of the attacking units, then all attacking units are adjacent, then they may combine their strength as long as a leader is stacked with one of the attacking units. Okay, well, if you're not using the leader rules, then, you know, what's up with that? <clears throat> units can't stack or they can stack but they just can't combine fire you know because you only use uh there's also an integrity rule which also um, requires leaders and we'll get to that here in a second anyway i know you don't understand what i'm saying but um maybe you do uh let's see we have combat modifiers which is basically um little round top swisher's hill and the angle and if you're attacked through your flank or rear hex sides. Then we have diversionary attacks, which is kind of like in your old days of, you know, you can attack one unit at low odds to get a better attack elsewhere at higher odds. Then we have leadership and divisional integrity, rule 8.6. Um, only units of the same division may combine to attack the same enemy occupied hex. This combined attack may only take place if the division leader is present for the attack. I'll move my camera here because my <clears throat> on off button is right in the way. Sorry. Um, it's present for the attack. That is, stacked with any attacking unit. Due to the intensity of the fighting and blah blah blah, there's a little um, designer note there. Units adjacent to an enemy unit but unable to combine for attack due to leadership or divisional differences will have a unit selected by the owning player to conduct the attack. The others may not attack or advance after combat or absorb combat losses. They must, however, retreat if the attacking unit retreats. Sorry for the blur. And then we have uh, combat results, which are numerical. One, two, three. Uh, you can 
take a step ball, stay in the hex, or retreat one hex for a one result. A two result is similar. You can retreat two hexes or take two step losses or any combination thereof. And this also applies to a three result. Anyway, my major com um, question is, you know, if you're not using the optional leader rules, then what do you do? How do you combine units? How do divisions uh, attack together and, and get uh, divisional integrity, that type of thing? Anyway, we pretty much have retreat rules, advancing as a result of combat, and I'm sorry, I got my camera. There we go. I'm on my way to the big time here. Oh, let's see. And then we have scenarios. There's like three scenarios. You know, you got your historical scenario, that type of thing. Um, and all that. Then we have the Union Artillery Rule, which is just above the Command Control Rule. Which um, says, the near destruction of the Union Third Corps left a hole in the Union line on Cemetery Ridge. For a short time, this hole was occupied only by Union artillery, which managed to stabilize the situation long enough for fresh troops to be brought up. This role simulates the effect of the Union artillery on the battle. On any Union player turn after turn 4, the Union player has three artillery points available to him. Each point fires using the 5-6 to six column on the small arm CRT. Uh, let's see, the artillery points may be employed in any clear, unoccupied, union-controlled hex east of hex row 19XX column of the hexes of hexes and north of the XX11 hex row. All small arms rules um, apply in the event of a Confederate unit is forced to retreat by the artillery and the only avenue of retreat leads through a union unit or zone of control, the Confederate unit is not required to execute the retreat. Um, units that retreat through enemy zones of control due to combat lose an additional step normally. And then we come to, there's not much else to that, command control, which I will just go ahead and illustrate. Oh, I know this is pretty rudimentary, but it's part of an optional rule. And command control is... Each commander, has, each commander has a command radius of two hexes. Units of his division within the command radius may move and attack normally. Let me get a commander unit here just to kind of show you what they're all about. Don't bounce around on me. This is Union uh, Division Commander Gibbon. <clears throat> if, uh, it'll focus okay. There you go. Um... For each unit outside the command radius, a die is rolled, the, union, or the unit may move the number rolled minus one. For example, a three is rolled, the unit has two movement points, and this is for units that are outside the two hex radius. There's really no information on the leader except his name and his higher formation. And then we have if a unit starts its movement outside the command radius of its division commander, uh, it may only enter an enemy zone of control on a 1, 2, or 3. And the division commander can become a casualty. And if he is, you pull him off the map, put him on the turn track, comes back next turn, something like that. Anyway, I have a little bit of problems with, like I said, um, how your leader, commander type counters act and don't act. Um, because the only leaders you have are divisional leaders. You don't have any higher organization leader. And these leaders, like I say, start on the board with their particular unit. Like with the union setup, we have Bernie, and he'll start stack he'll start the game stacked with Graham in hex twelve oh two. And then we'll have the uh, first brigade third division, Ward, he'll start in 1611, and so on. So, the leaders start on the board, um, stacked usually with their divisions, and so you have leaders from the beginning, but some of the roles on zone of control, mandatory combat, leader effects, that type of thing, you know, I'm still kind of, still kind of not uh, quite sure. I'm guessing, under the command control rule, now that I think about it, it probably is just addressing 
um, movement of the actual units if they're out of the command control radius. And this command control is only applying it to movement, whereas, now that I think about it, yeah, okay, it's making a little bit more sense now as I talk it over. Um, in close assault and stuff, I guess the leaders can make affect the uh, stacking and the, not, the units which can attack in the division. Okay, well, it kind of helps to uh, reread the rules a couple times and talk it over. The only thing I'm not sure about is why, if all units must attack, you can ignore that, um, ignore that particular rule and just have one unit attack, you know, if you're attacking as a combined whole, whatever. Let's take a look at the map, and um, that will pretty much be it. For this brief uh, look at this game. Let's pull out here just a minute. The map itself is quite small. It has a very small footprint. Looks to me like it's about, oh... 11 by, I don't know, a little over 17, 11 by 22 maybe, yeah. Anyway, it's not very large. Here we have a human hand uh, for reference. We have turn track here, it's eight turns long. Up here, I don't know if we can see it all. This is the small arms fire table. We have a close assault table, train affixed chart, and then we have a train key, and that's pretty much it. Um, there's different elevations. We'll try to go from low to high. <clears throat> the lowest terrain, <clears throat> sorry, is this dark green. Then we go up a little higher to this lighter green. And then we'll go up here um, to this uh, clear, I mean, it's all clear, but um, whatever color you want to call this, green, whatever. And then we go, let's see, to this color, a little bit higher. It's like 580 meters. And then at the, we have a way over here, like at the, the round tops, we have the dark brown, and that's the highest terrain uh, on the map at 660 meters. Um, there's not much else to really go over. Units move, I like to do in most text encounter games. They spend their movement points in their different types of terrain. Um, each type costing a different amount of movement. Units that, like I say, are, that are adjacent. Well, like fire is two hexes. Everybody has to face a hex side. And apparently I can fire at him or at him. Yeah, I guess we'll get up here a little bit more so you can see what's going on. Uh, Bernie here could fire at McClaw's uh, Woolard. Or Hood's G. Anderson. Um, the actual rules say, like I said, out to the center front hex, but apparently the diagram says I can shoot either of those units. And basically, I take the six, Bernie six. Let's see how close I can get without having to actually move anything. Oh, maximum range here. Um, let's see if you can see this anywhere. Yeah, you get an idea. Anyway, there's no other modifications, no terrain, although they are... I can only fire at one of them, so I'll fire at um, McClaw's war because he's on the same terrain. Otherwise, I have a penalty for firing up to a higher terrain. Well, actually, that's a lower terrain. Either way. Uh, so he'll fire on this column, the 5 and 6 column. I don't know if you can see that clearly. Roll the die, see what the result is. 4... Um, the 5 and 6 is going to be nothing, no result. So that fire would be ineffective. Um, close combat. Well, let's go ahead and put him here. Let's say that it's a Confederate player attacking. I guess I need to show you what is happening. Let us say the Confederate player is attacking here. Oops. Sorry. There we go. We focused. And we focus. Let's see here. I think that's close enough. <clears throat> Let's see here. If the Confederate, if it's a Confederate's turn and we're going after Bernie here, 
we have two different divisions here. So according to the rules, these two units cannot combine to attack Bernie at a uh, Bernie's strength of six. We have a seven, or we have an eight. So McClaws or Hood have to be, you know, they have to be within two hexes, and McClaw has to actually be participating in that attack. So it's either going to be one or the other. And this is where I get kind of confused because let's say McClaws, Wollard, uh, Wolford decides to um, attack the Union unit. Um, then what do you do with uh, Hood's Anderson unit? I mean, you know, he's in the zone of control, frontal zone of control. That's the only place there is a zone of control. Um, so what, he just kind of hangs back? Um, you know, combat's supposed to be mandatory. He's part of a different division. The leader is not with him or involved with that attack. So, you know, what do you do? The rules kind of say that one unit can attack and then this unit will suffer whatever effects the results of combat are, but I don't know. It's kind of goofy to me. But anyway, we'd be looking at, what, 7 to 6, 1 to 1. There's no modifier for terrain or a flanking attack. Come over here to the, ah, sorry, close assault table at 1 to 1. I don't know if you can see this. I guess I can move a little bit closer. You can tell that I have no public speaking skills. <clears throat> or very few speaking skills whatsoever. Okay, it's hard to just talk to a camera. I just don't, you know. Just not, that's just the way it is. Sorry. Okay, so it'd be a one to one attack right here. There's no shifts for terrain, like I said. There's no shifts for uh, rear or flank attacks. So we're going to be using just this column here. There's no difference in the coloration. Um, whoever designed the game just decided that uh, that's what they do. So we'll roll a four at one to one. Come down here to the four, and they, there's a numerical result of one slash one. The attacker will have um, a combat effect of one, and the defender will have a combat effect of one. And as I stated earlier in the rules, I'm going to get over here to where the battle was. Yeah, I think we're close there. Bernie can stay and flip over. Uh, if he doesn't want to give up the ground, he can take a step boss and stay as a four strength unit, or he can retreat back one hex and remain um, at his full strength. Then McClaw, McClaw's uh, brigade and Demi, Demi brigade can advance into the hex, but they have to also take a uh, step loss. So they'll take it from the three. If they want to advance, they have to take the step loss. If they, they have to take the step loss no matter what. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. They can't, I don't think they can get out of it by retreating. Anyway, they flip over and advance to, uh, into that hex. Let me double check on that real quick. All right. Let's see, these guys that attacked Bernie, they both had a 1-1. One -one. I guess he was about right here. Anyway, the example is still continuing. Um, they both received a 1-1 one, one result. So, the defender can either retreat one hex or take a step loss and remain in the hex. So that's still somewhat uh, focused. The confederate player has to take a step loss as well and may advance one unit into the vacated hex if there is a vacated hex. So if the union player decides to just go ahead and take the step loss, then there'll be no advance after combat. The attacker does not, the attacker I think can also withdraw if he wants to, to avoid a step loss. But if he wants to stay, then one of the units has to be flipped over as well. So anyway, I know that was kind of painful and I apologize. But uh, that's kind of how it is. So anyway, that is a brief, quick look at Strategy and Tactics, issue 129, 1989, um, second day at Gettysburg, Harvest of Death.
So I intend to probably take a look at the old Yaquinto Panzer game next. I know I've got uh, actually I've got the miniature version, miniatures version of Panzer. I have GMT's Panzer. I have Yaquinto's Panzer. And well, let's just say I have several um, copies of Panzer. Anyway, when we when I come back, if anybody's still here, we will take a little bit longer, more detailed look at it um, with some play and all that type of stuff. So um, I'll see you later.